Hello and welcome to this special edition of the Africa Here and Now podcast. It's the conversation you've always wanted to have about Africa. I'm Martine Dennis. Now recently, in episode 7, we asked the question, is anyone safe in Nigeria? because of the seemingly endless cases of mass killings and kidnappings for ransom. We had a great discussion with Dr. Chidi Odinkalu, who told us that those responsible for much of the violence and criminality have often been in the employ of corrupt politicians who use them as muscle to disrupt elections. Well, Donu Kogbara, our panellist, concurred with Chidi and referred to her own horrifying ordeal of being kidnapped almost 10 years ago. Well, I promised then that we'd get Donu to tell us more about when she was awoken by two armed men, bundled into a jeep, then offloaded into a boat, which took her to a tiny hut on stilts in the middle of a remote mangrove swamp. Now, Donu's an eminent journalist with an international reputation. She comes from Rivers State in the Niger Delta region. That's where the vast majority of Nigeria's oil wealth is located. But this region also has among the highest youth unemployment rates in the country, around 30%. Two thirds of the population of this region are under the age of 30. Young men with no job and few prospects are all too often lured into armed robbery or kidnapping for ransom. So it was in August 2015 that Donu's nightmare began at her home in Port Harcourt, the capital of Rivers State. So it was a Sunday morning. My mother was preparing for her weekly um, church trip. It was about 20 to 7. And um, as she was leaving the house, a couple of jeeps full of men, armed men, rolled up and they jumped out and asked her to take them to her daughter. So, you know, trembling, poor thing. She was way over 70 at that stage. She um, took them to my bedroom at the other end of the house. They asked if there was anyone else in the house. She said, apart from the domestic staff, two young girls, no. So he said, well, they asked where the domestic staff were and, um, found them in their bedroom getting ready for the day and made them lie face down and then came into my bedroom where I was also about to get up and, you know, start moving about and um, demanded my jewellery and money. They asked me what, what I had. So I just thought it was a routine armed robbery until they asked me to get dressed and follow them. Then I realized I was being kidnapped. And it's funny, it's a, it's a fear I had had all year because that year in Port Harcourt, kidnapping was so rife, everybody knew someone who had been kidnapped. And I'd actually said to my mother, funnily enough, about, I don't know, six months prior to this, you know, kid, we need to get out of here for a while. The tension's too much. So I guess I wasn't really surprised that it had finally happened to me because I had always said to my mother, that we are targets. We're the sort of people they go for. So anyway, I told them I was hypertensive, asked if I could pick up my meds. They agreed. Picked up my handbag. Funnily enough, that's the handbag I'm using today. You Such still have quality, it. darlings. Yes, it's a Chanel. <laughs> <laughs> but of course. Yeah. You know what I mean? I mean, sometimes quality counts. <laughs> but, I mean, did they allow you to get dressed? What were you wearing as they, as they hustled you up? No, they were, they were, you know, they were, they were, you know, quite respectful. I mean, I was wearing, I, I think I left in leggings and some kind of baggy T-shirt. Not very, yeah. And um, so I picked up my handbag, picked up my mitts, which were on the side table. And we left. They blindfolded me and pushed my head down. And we passed a couple of police checkpoints, actually. 
And some pros come to check by us. They didn't stop us or look inside the car, so my head was down. And then we got to this isolated river state, Port Harcourt. Is, um, it's, a, it's a coastal town. And so we got to this place on the coast um, where there was a jetty. And a couple of little boys, half naked boys, were playing there. And when they saw us, they sort of stepped back respectfully. They'd clearly seen this before. They weren't surprised. And they stepped back, and I was led into a, a speedboat. I think it was called Victorious. And um, I was blindfolded, and we just were on the water for ages. And I, I do love, I do love boats and water and fresh air. So I actually enjoyed the journey. And um, eventually we got to this hut on stilts in the middle of nowhere, literally surrounded by water. Uh, the only land was some sort of mangrove swamps. And so they moored the boat and um, and blindfolded me so I could walk into the hut. Donny, you sound as though you were quite calm at this point. I was very calm. Um, actually only went with two people, even though there had been more of them at the actual site of the kidnapping. We left some behind on the mainland when we set off on the boat journey. And I was with them, um, basically, they, they left me with one guard. And were they rough? Were they rough with you at that point? No. I mean, you know, a bit of this gangster talk, like, shut up if you ask any questions, you know, that kind of thing. Um, but, you know, I, I didn't have a sense that they intended to harm me at that stage. Now, I've, I've read your account, Donu, and uh, what stands out um, is your fear particularly of these planks, these planks which formed a kind of walkway for you to get into this hut. Yes, it's absolutely terrifying. Um, and the thing is, it wasn't just the once to get there and then to come back at the end of the 13 or 14 days. I had to use those planks every day to go to the bathroom because how the thing was arranged was the hut was in one place, surrounded by a mangrove swamp, and mangrove is not terra firma. So then there were sort of like one or two areas of firm ground where they had things like where they had their showers or rather baths out of buckets and where they had their toilets. So to get there, I had to walk those planks every day. I tried to minimize the water I drank, the food I ate, so I wouldn't have to go to the bathroom, but I, I basically needed to go every day. It was terrible. I don't know how I don't, I don't know how I failed to fall into the murky depths below because <clears throat> I was always trembling. They did, you know, they, there was always someone holding my hand and saying, "Come on, come on," but it was scary. Um, and your relationship then with your two guards, if you like, I mean, that's also fascinating uh, because you managed to, to strike up a certain rapport, at least with one of them. Yes, there was a guy called um, Engineer. He was educated fairly well so. And he stayed with me. And, you know, we, 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 we got to talking. And um, he told me how he had been pulled out of school at a young age, because his parents couldn't afford to take his education any further. I told him how terrible I thought that was. Um, I think he sensed some genuine sympathy from me about the lot of the working, ordinary working people in Nigeria, and, and the non-working, because there's a very high unemployment rate. And we talked, we talked a lot. He told me a lot of stuff about his family, his life. He was quite angry. Um, one thing about me, even now that I've been in Nigeria for 25 years, I don't know why people instantly spot me as basically foreign. 
even when they don't know that I grew up abroad. Do you think that that um, endeared you to engineer and the others, or do you think that that served to rile them even more? Because it's clearly it's clearly evidence of your privilege. Yes, well, it's it's a mis- it's a mixture really. And he talked a lot about the thieving government people, the thieving ruling elite. And I told him, I agree with you, the bunch of wankers, thieves. And, you know, kind of we talked about things like awarding themselves massive contracts through their friends or directly and dipping their hands in the coffers. Now, but, you know, obviously people who went to school abroad or grew up abroad are regarded as being super privileged because, you know, um, because they are. And it's a kind of mixture. Their attitude is schizophrenic, if you like. Because on the one hand, they do believe that Europeans have a more compassionate, civilized system. They, they know that if you cannot afford rent or food in the UK, that the government will pick up the bill. Okay? This is not the case in Nigeria. So in some ways, they regard foreigners as, be, as being more benign. They know these things partly because some of them are educated enough to have done enough reading to know enough about what's going on outside Nigeria. But some of them also have relatives and friends who are doing stuff like minicabbing in London or Frankfurt. So on the one hand, they think foreigners are kinder. On the other hand, they think, well, you know, kind of, you, you are a super privileged person. Absolutely. What were the... What was it like inside the hut? I mean, what did you have? Was there a table? Were, were there chairs? No. Basically, there were sort of like mats and things, so we were on the floor all the time. We were, jo- we were later joined to the point where I was with nine people in this tiny hut. And so we lay like sardines at night, side by side, squeezed up together. Because at that stage, I was 55. And so, you know... Nigerians do have, in my view, an admirable attitude towards older people. There's a certain respect, it seems, yes. that you enjoyed with your captors up, a, up until a point. All of them, yeah. There wasn't, none of them were, were, I don't think any of them were up to 35 years old. Nobody was over 35. Some of them were in their 20s. There was a respectful relationship with Practically all of them, actually. There was one in particular, Mamu, who was very tall. I remember him tall. And he called me Male, which means mommy, mother, in the Ijo language, the local Ijo language. And they were all quite respectful. They asked me loads of questions. I mean, it's almost like they would sit around me. It was like a campfire, you know, as if we'd gone camping. You know, we're sitting, maybe they were sitting in some hut in the middle of some weird forest or, you know, whatever, and we're, we're talking. And they ask me questions like, did I have children? Do I have any pictures of my son? I turned my phone on. They didn't want the phone on because the security forces can track your lo- location through a phone. But they said, oh, go on, turn on the phone for a couple of minutes. And I showed the pictures of Oliver, my son, and they were saying things like, oh, oh, look at his ankle socks. Oh, oh. Look at his shoes, you know? And my son then was a student. He was about, you know, 18 or something or 19. And they were saying things like, oh, I wish I'd had that kind of life. And um, I, it was very touching, actually. They asked me what he did, and I told him. And they said, gosh, you know, kind of, you must be so rich. Because another thing they did when I turned my phone on was they scrolled through the names and they saw all kinds of recognizable names like the president and, you know, VIPs. <clears throat> and they said, you really, really are one of them, aren't you? Kind of. You are kind of one of them. Well, they saw, they saw your connect, you're, you're very well connected, obviously, as, a, as an eminent journalist. But they, these... They, but they also saw my family home. And one of them, I was going to say that they were all respectful to some extent, except for one called, what's that his name again, Kane or something, and then um, the one they called the boss, boss man. And, you know, they, they sort of joined us a little bit later. 
Mossburn was angry. He was furious. He hated rich people. He hated privileged people. And he was one of the people who dragged me out of the house. And he joined us later. And he sort of said, well, you know, she's not even just an ordinary member of the thieving elite. You should see her father's house. And I must tell you that there was a time when my family home was possibly the best in the Niger Delta. Um, it, it's not so much that it was massive, it's quite large, but it was because it was in landscape gardens with the tennis court and all that kind of stuff. And so they said, they are so rich, they don't need to, they, don't, they, didn't, they, need, they didn't use their land to build properties to get rent from. You know, these, these people are seriously well off. So boss man kept on reminding them because they were enthralled by me. They were enthralled by me, by the stories I told, the sympathy I expressed towards their circumstances. So boss man kept on saying, don't be fooled by her. She's the worst of the whole bloody lot. Most of the governors and politicians and people whom we hate came from poor families. She's been rich all her life. You should see her family home. So there was a lot of that going on. <clears throat> But you know, when he tried that, they'd say, leave her alone. She's nice, you know? So there, there was a dynamic even between them, between me and them and between themselves. But these are guys, these are guys with guns, aren't they? I mean, did you fear yeah. violence of, of any sort at any point? The angry one, boss man, when he showed up, because he, he was part of the kidnap, original kidnap party, but he did not join us initially. So when he showed up, he was, he was full of anger, and he beat me up a couple of times. At one point, he hogtied me to a beam on the ceiling, like a sort of like a goat or a ram or whatever, and started beating me with a stick of wood. Then another time, he hit, I'm convinced one of the reasons why my knees are so sensitive now that I'm overweight is because he actually, he had a go at my knees with um, a cudgel. They would hold him back, but, you know, kind of. So he tried that two or three times. And after that, I think Malé, the tall one, said, look, honestly, if you do that to Malé again, you know, it's going to be really difficult for me to stand back and, you know, no, no you've got to stop. So I had problems from Bossman. And then towards the end, I don't know, day eight, day nine, I can't remember, another one showed up who they said was a known rapist. He specialized in raping female hostages. And the reason he hadn't joined us is because he'd had a family funeral to attend. And so <clears throat> he's had a family funeral to attend. So he came late. And from the moment he arrived, he started threatening to rape me. And again, you know, kind of the other said, you know, don't even think about it. So they were kind of protecting you. They were so there was a almost a guard. I'd say yeah. Out of out of the out of the nine, there were seven, were consistently respectful and protective. Then boss man blew hot and cold. So you didn't feel fear. No, I did. I mean, when I was hogtied, it was terrible. You know, it was painful. It was humiliating. Um, and then when he, he when he attacked my knees with the cudgel, that was also. Humiliating. I didn't think, I never thought they would kill me though, unless, unless the police tried to raid the joint. And at that stage, we didn't know if they knew where we were. <clears throat> Sometimes we would hear helicopters and things above, because remember, we're back in the middle of the creeks. You look left, right, back, front, there is no land, just a hut on stilts. These huts traditionally are used by fishermen who go to the deep sea to fish. They told me we were in Cameroonian waters. I was later told by the police that they'd actually managed to track us and that we were actually not that far from Port Harcourt. But anyway, who, could, who knew? We were on the water for hours before we got there. And <clears throat> so I, my only fear was that the police would find us and try to rescue me, in which case they would have killed me. I didn't want, I did not want the authorities to try to rescue me. I wanted my family to pay a ransom and so I could be released. And what were the conditions like in the hut? I'm just trying to get a sense. I mean, at, at one point you've got nine people in there. There's um, a mattress. You're all sleeping side by side. 
Uh, what about um, food arrangements? How was food provided? Okay, well, the first engineer arrived with quite a lot of food, lots of dried produce, stuff that was, wasn't too perishable. Every couple of days, <coughs> every couple of days, fresh meat, fish, whatever, would be sent from the mainland by their accomplices. So someone come and dump stuff. So we actually had proper meals. There was a kerosene stove in the corner. And, you know, engineer, remember, remember had been a catering trainee. And boss man was surprisingly good at cooking too. Um, so there were two or three of them who took responsibility for food. Sometimes they caught crabs from the water and made crab pepper soup. I didn't eat much because I really didn't want to be going to the loo every five minutes. One thing about the food that stands out in my mind is asking boss man where he learned to cook so well. Because he cooked an okra soup, a soup of okra and fish that was absolutely delicious. And I said to him, who taught you to cook like this? Was it your mother? And he went completely ballistic and tried to beat me up. I said, don't ever, don't ever mention that prostitute. He just went ballistic. Anyway, in journalistic style, I did probe a little to find out who they were, where they were coming from. And yeah, you'll all call me a Tory, but I can tell you, which I'm not, but you know, I am quite conservative about certain things, um, as I am radical about others. And one thing I noticed is that most of them did not grow up in proper homes. So they seemed to be the children of women who had had children by different men. Um, only one, <clears throat> only one admitted to having had any kind of normal family life. His father had been a soldier, and so his father, mother, and himself had, and his siblings had grown up in Lukaja, in some army encampment. The rest of them, it was like people on council estates in the UK. Right, so they'd they'd come from a certain socioeconomic class. Um, they had, hadn't really finished uh, schooling, um, and they presumably had no jobs. Um, you actually felt a certain amount of empathy for them, didn't you? You actually related. I felt total empathy. I felt total empathy. I mean, I actually had a line, the opening line of the article I wanted, I wrote for the Sunday Times magazine a few months later, was removed. I think they found it too, you know, they just, you know, it was too much for them. I said, <clears throat> in kidnapping is the most intelligent and justifiable crime. If you were born dirt poor in a country with a predatory elite and a weak law enforcement system. And that's just how I feel. You see, the thing is, if you're a poor boy <clears throat> with no future, um, no education, <clears throat> no one to help you get some cushy job somewhere. <clears throat> and by cushy job, I mean everything I mean, include lowly jobs like being a, a, a servant in someone's house or, you know, very, very lowly jobs. Well, your option is really, I mean, I know there's never any excuse for crime, but there is. And um, I, I, I felt that if I was uh, one of those boys, I might have turned to kidnapping myself, because it makes total sense. You grab rich people, and you make them pay for their freedom. But at the time, was that, even though you had a certain empathy for them and you, and you understood the, the rationale, if you like, for the, the, them, the actions that they had taken, did it make the experience any easier, though? You must have been, uh, uh, did you despair? You must have despaired at some point. Well, it didn't, it didn't make, yes, I did despair. Uh, and I'll tell you why in a minute. You see, the thing is, I just totally understood. But I think it cut both ways. They also understood me. They understood that it wasn't my fault. I was born into privilege. And that it was the quality of my, the content of my character was as important as where I had started in life. And yeah, I told them a lot of stuff and I agreed with them on a lot of stuff. And I think they believed me. Um... I think they knew I wasn't, I wasn't messing with them, that I was equally disgusted by some of the things that have turned Nigeria into the mess it is today. And um, I told them if I was in their shoes, I'd probably be a kidnapper myself. 
did they understand that you're a journalist, you're, you've been a campaigning journalist, you've campaigned on the very issues that they are uh, complaining about. So you're actually on the same side as them. Did they understand that? I think they did. Even boss man stopped beating me and trying to hog tie me because he'd get into a rage because I'd asked about his mother whom he clearly hated or, you know, some issue or the other. And even boss man joins the circle on the floor, sitting around like, you know, kind of like I'm some kind of scout master or mistress telling them stories about life. And, um, yeah, and I think they were very impressed that I had been there when the Niger Delta militant leaders went to the presidential villa to sign an amnesty agreement whereby they promised to stop blowing up oil pipelines. They understood that I was a kind of activist Niger Delta person, that I shared their view that we come from an oil producing part of the country and that it's not fair for just a tiny handful of Niger Delta VIPs to get oil blocks or whatever. And that, you know, kind of the people who really suffer from the environmental degradation and all that are ordinary people like themselves and they get nothing. So they were quite impressed. I, I gave them enough information for them to know that I'd been there. Because by the way, these militant leaders were their bosses. They all reported to somebody. It's, it was like, it's like an army. I was captured by one division of a militant army. And interestingly, you made the point that the origins of these these groups, these uh, uh, syndicates, if you like, the origins are actually their political patrons because they're they're capitalized upon, aren't they, by by local politicians? That's right. They also named the politicians who had sponsored them during the election, and they were thoroughly furious because. They hadn't been paid. Because in this country, people hire thugs to help them with elections all over the country. It's particularly bad in the Niger Delta. So they had been hired. The election had taken place earlier on that year in 2015. And they had been hired to disrupt polling booths, shoot people, do all kinds of terrible things to help their candidates win. And they hadn't been paid in full. So they were very bitter about that. They're very angry with President Jonathan as well, who is famous in Nigeria for having conceded defeat to President Buhari. Um, nobody has ever done that in this country, and for that, Jonathan will always be revered by some people. But these are Jonathan's people. These are our people from that part of the country, and they felt Jonathan was a wuss, a wimp, and he should never have conceded. They were very, very angry with him. So they're hired. I mean, they're hired. They're they're the muscle for a, a political campaign. What happens when after the election? When the elections are what every four years? What happens to them? Are they just dropped unceremoniously by their sponsors? Yes, they are usually dropped unceremoniously if they're not brought on board to you know the security guards or whatever. Um, some of them are legitimised, but. Most of them are just cut loose. And then they do things like kidnapping to keep themselves body and soul together. But another interesting thing worth noting, though, is that even in the kidnapping realm, they are not masters of their own destinies. Um, they have bosses, and they told me that whatever my family or the government paid, they would only get a very small percentage of the fee because the ransom money mostly goes to the big Jesus. I suppose it's a bit like Cosa Nostra, Mafioso, whatever. They were the foot. They're, they're, they are the foot soldiers. What were they asking for? What what kind of sum of money were they demanding? I think they initially asked for two million dollars, and that was another thing. That whole ransom thing was probably the most the thing that stands out most in my mind. I think they initially asked for two million dollars. Um, now the newspaper I write for Vanguard the owner of Vanguard, because what they do is they tell you, okay, call four people you can trust to care enough to pay for your freedom. So I called my mother. She was totally useless. <laughs> she was in pieces, in bits. Um, called a couple of other people, political people, and I called the owner of my newspaper. 
of the newspaper I write for. And um, he offered them a quarter of a million dollars. Now, by now, the whole thing is being monitored by Shell, partly because my father was the, in the first... Ma my father was one of the first African managers of Shell in the 1950s, okay, when Shell started to recruit Nigerians. The British government, UK Gulf, also took a keen interest, and, of course, the Nigerian police force. And as a thank you very much, media colleagues, they made so much fuss, both the Nigerian media and the international media, made so much fuss that it became a cause celebre. People on the outside told me, I mean, we had a radio in the heart anyway. And you know, kind of, I was the star of the show, every bloody bulletin. Yeah, um, British journalist, Donny Kubar, Nigerian journalist, Donny Kubar, he's still in captivity, blah, 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 blah. So there was an awful lot of pressure on the government to do something and get this sorted. And um, so, because it was being closely monitored by all these people, when Uncle Sam, that's what I call the owner of Vanguard, when Uncle Sam offered a quarter of a million dollars, they jumped on him and they said, you've got to withdraw the offer. If you pay a quarter of a million dollars, every editor, every columnist on your newspaper will be kidnapped in the next six months. And um, they will not understand that you are especially fond of Donu. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? They, they, they will go after everybody, all your staff. So I remember the day he offered the quarter of a million dollars and the guys, they always ask for more than what they really expect. And I think a quarter of a million US dollars was pretty well, was better than they expected. So they were kind of like celebrating and they even poured me a glass of whiskey and actually we drank quite a lot. They had plenty of booze. So they said, let's, double, let's have a party. So having a party, clicking glasses and everything, and say, hey, yay, you'll soon be free. And, um, and then Uncle Sam withdrew the offer where he just stood back and was told to. And boss man went ballistic. I got a thorough beating for that withdrawal. And of course, poor old Uncle Sam didn't know this would happen. But I think they were probably right to tell him not to pay that kind of money. So what happened? We went back to square one. We went back to modest sums, you know? You know, $20,000, $30,000. It would inch up. I had a friend called Uche. Uche was in charge of negotiators, negotiating on behalf of the government. Um, but, you know, he didn't admit he was negotiating on behalf of the governor or any government person, if I recall rightly. So he would say things like, okay, we'll give you six million naira, which in those days was something. And they say, fuck off. And they say, all right then, 6.5. So it was inching every day, they would inch it up by. And I remember grabbing the phone from one of the kidnappers and saying to Jay, how dare you offer only five million naira for my life? Are you mad? You know, kind of thing. Could you please just offer realistic sums so I can get out of here? You know? And I actually wound up, it's funny, talking about Stockholm Syndrome. I would sit there with them bitching about my relatives and friends. <laughs> you know? Can you just, I mean, how dare they? What's my one say to me? Can you imagine uh, 6.5 million now? Are they mad? You know, do they want you to live? And I'd say, exactly. So it was that, kind of, that was the vibe. And sometimes when, if a helicopter or something would, because occasionally we had to switch on our phones to talk to people on the mainland or whatever. They had a, a strange kind of, anyway, it's a long story, strange kind of satellite phone thing. And um, they would cock their guns every time they thought if they had a speedboat in the distance or a helicopter circling above, or they would, they'd be ready and I would be with them saying, I wish they'd mind their business. Why can't they mind their business and leave us alone? We're fine. <laughs> so why can't they just pay the money and bugger off? I was so angry. I was totally with the kids. And how, how were you finally released? What, what happened? My sister came up with a sum 
that was, I mean, a lot of friends chipped in. A lot of friends chipped in, apparently. Um, it was about £25,000 that we paid in the end. We did pay a ransom. Um, I think it was in Naira at the time. And a drop-off was arranged in Port Harcourt. And, you know, the usual warnings, if we so much as see a plainclothes policeman or a uniformed policeman anywhere within half a mile, you know, kind of, she's dead meat. So there were hairy moments. Um, there were moments when I thought, well, you know, with all this messing around with the ransom and everything, I'm probably going to wind up being killed and dumped in this one. And there was a time when I thought, okay, I'm never going to see Oliver again. Because it dragged on for, it went on forever, the negotiations. Now, I later cornered the guy from Shell, who, by the way, was one of the masterminds. And he said, look, sorry, you have to understand, there's a tactic to it. They mustn't get the feeling that there's loads of money sitting somewhere. They've got to feel that you're putting together, you know, 10 quid here, 50 quid there, and that your friends and family are trying their best to come up with something. So conceivably then, that, um, that tactic that was being uh, used by the Shell guy and others, um, that, that extended your, your ordeal? Well, it's extended my ordeal, but it clearly was a sensible thing to do. I think it also helped that it was, of course, an epic. You know, um, I think, because boss might kept on saying, ah, even the foreign journalists in Lagos are asking where she is. And the trouble, no, I had too much of Six o'clock news, nine o'clock news. They, they started getting jittery, you know? And um, the, the, gra the, the graphic description of people they'd killed in the past, it was very real. So you think your age um, saved you a lot of, of um, horror? in this experience, but also it sounds as though you kept your wits about you and you were a journalist right up until the last moment. You were almost interviewing them. Yes, that's very true. Um, and um, actually towards the end, they started calling me Madam General because I just got, at one point I just had enough. I'm on a day 10 or something and I said, you know what? When they, because they called themselves, you know, generals in the war, they like to see themselves as freedom fighters. So, you know, this kidnapping is part of a wider strategy to, to fight back against a Nigerian state that has stolen oil from the ordinary people of the Niger Delta and enriched itself, leaving them penniless and all that. So, um, one day I lost my temper. I said, you're not generals. I mean, you know, come on, you know, blah, 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 blah. And, and by the way, you know, I have been to Bosnia, and you don't scare me. I remember saying this to Bosnia, you don't scare me. I've been to Bosnia, I've been to, um, what's that place in it, Tigray, and you don't even know where these places are. I have been to war zones, so don't mess with me. Kill me if you like. And I laid my hand, I said, God, shoot. Now, at that point, they said, they, they actually stood and saluted and said, Madame General, sit down, Madame General. How have you processed this Awful ordeal. I mean, you're talking really matter-of-factly about it, um, and it's obviously some nearly 10 years ago. But how have you processed that? Because I can imagine it must have had uh, quite a, a, um, a profound a a effect on you. I, you know, I, I don't want to be too dramatic, because there are many people who have been kidnapped in this country. I'm not the only one by any means. And some of them have gone back to live in the houses they were kidnapped from and the towns they were kidnapped from. And so, but, you know, to be honest with you, it has almost ruined my life. I have, I've never been able to sleep in my home in Port Harcourt since that night in 2015. Well, when I was released, I slept there one night and, you know, I couldn't sleep. And then I was summoned to... Abuja to meet the Inspector General of Police and Shell were very kind. They gave me, they, they immediately took me into their hospital. I got psychiatric treatment, I got physical care. Um, but, you know, despite the care I, I received, I also went to a distinguished psychiatrist in London, had a few sessions with him. He works with um, newspapers like the Financial Times. 
um, on because I mean apparently PTSD is quite common amongst journalists who have you know been in difficult situations or in war zones. And despite all that, I would say it turned me into a nervous wreck. Um, I had what I call daymares, hallucinations. I mean, I'd be talking to people. They wouldn't even know what was going through my mind. It's funny. I learned how to sort of parallel speak. I'd be having a perfectly rational conversation with somebody about anything, work, life. And at the same time, I'd see snakes coming at me. They'd rise from the ground. They'd become rigid like torpedoes, and then they'd come at me and wrap themselves around my neck and squeeze all kinds of things. I had terrible, terrible daymares. I imagined myself covered in gunshot wounds, injuries dripping off my body, bleeding. I'd be sitting on a plane and I'd see, in inverted commas, you know. Can you get help for this? Can you get help for this now, Donnie? Um, well, I did get help. The, the shrink, I saw in London, said, look, you know, to be quite honest with you, the best thing I could suggest is put you on antipsychotic medication. Um, he said, you're lucky because you know that those snakes aren't real. You know that the injuries, the bullet holes covering your body are not real. It's just that you see them, but you know they're not real. He says a lot of people in your situation believe that there are snakes, and those are the ones who cannot be helped. Or at least those are the ones whom it's very difficult to help. And you're talking about one or two colleagues who'd had bad experiences in places like Afghanistan. Anyway, so um, I was put on, I, I was put, yeah, I was put on medication, and it was terrible because it made me you either you either sleeping you know twenty hours a day or you're seeing the J bears and you're exhausted all the time. And it, it, they didn't completely get rid of the bad images, but they muted them. It was like turning the volume down. And um, they also had a physical effect because I put on between one and two kilos every month. I took those meds for three years. And I put on like up to two kilos a month for three years. That's a lot of weight. I mean, you know, that's why I, I am now 60 kilos overweight. Tell us more about the impact that this has had on the family. Um, well, my mother um, fell into deep depression and shortly afterwards started to suffer from what the psychiatrist described as um, trauma-induced dementia. She was quite elderly then and, you know, maybe it would have happened anyway, but... That is what happened. So I went off to England, and she was all alone with a carer in the house in Port Harcourt. And long story short, I came back, and I got a house in Abuja, and she moved her in with me. And that's where she died last year, almost eight years to the day when I was dragged out of my bedroom. I mean, she felt so bad that she was the one who led them to me. And I said, well, what choice did you have? They had a gun to your head. Now, another thing that's very interesting is that it was clearly an organized hit. So they came for me. It wasn't opportunistic. It wasn't spontaneous. And they told us that they had, they told me that they had worked with um, somebody around me, had given them information. Somebody had betrayed you? Yes. Somebody around them had told them when I would be in town, because I wasn't in Port Harcourt all the time. My son took it very badly, and, and, you know, kind of his father, you know, which was not his father's finest hour. He didn't get enough support from his father or his stepmother, um, financially or otherwise, or emotionally. My sister was a real trooper. She flew in as soon as I was kidnapped and, you know, participated in the negotiations for my release. And she was so rude. <laughs> she was so rude to the kidnappers, in their opinion, in boss man's opinion. He said, you know, that, that, that one is a little bitch. In fact, I'm going to go and collect her to come and keep you company. So at one point, he threatened to go to the mainland and get my sister and bring her to the hut um, because she was very sort of like, you know, she was very 
uppity with them. So they were all of them were apprehended? No, I don't think they apprehended all of them because <clears throat> I was sent first. The police made it their business. They thought that these guys had humiliated them internationally. So they made it their business to track them down and use everything they could. And I think they got some of them because they sent me photographs of Boss Man and about three others. I only recognized two or three of them. The rest, remember there were nine. The rest of them I didn't see. And I said, well, two of these guys I don't recognize at all. And he said, forget about that. These are their accomplices on the mainland. You never met them, but they were the ones sending food and cigarettes and drink. Yeah? I said, well, if you say so, but you can't ask me to identify people I've never seen. And what about engineer? What about engineer? Engineer was not in that picture. Those pictures that they sent me. They tracked Bossman across the country. Bossman ran away and they caught him. I now, a couple of months later, get these pictures of some of the people who had been in the hut with me. And um, I pleaded that they should be given prison sentences. Because, I mean, it's... And um, I will not name names, but let's just say a certain gentleman whom I know says she's mad. It's because she's spoonable. That means foreign. It's because she's like a white person. Don't mind her. These people are a, a cancer. Waste them. And they were lined up at the back of the police station and shot. I actually cried when I was told. Now, I've known Donny for a long time, and I still marvel at how she's worked through this terrifying episode. Well, that's all for this special edition of Africa Here and Now. Do get in touch. Let me know what you thought of Donny's story, martine at africaheroandnow.com. You can get us on YouTube. Africa Here and Now podcast is our channel. We're on Instagram, Facebook, and of course, wherever you get your podcasts. Now, we are an independent podcast. And if you like what we're doing, please consider becoming a paid subscriber so we can continue the conversations that get behind the headlines. Our website is www.africaheroandnow.com. You can donate as much or as little as you like. There you can also find out more about us, about our guests, and you can find all of our episodes there. My thanks to Donny. Anne Busby is our producer. Our original music is by Enric Adam. And thank you for your company. <laughs>